This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The U.S. President George W. Bush said that his country is not planning to build a military command for Africa. Meanwhile, Ghana expressed opposition to hosting any increased U.S. military presence on the African continent. Ghana welcomed the U.S. President George W. Bush as a friend, but said it would not host any increased U.S. military presence in Africa. This is the fourth and the second to last stop for Bush, who is on a tour in Western Africa. Several Ghanaian officials in Accra expressed reservation over hosting a U.S. military command for Africa. After waiting a few months to assess the situation, several U.S. officials returned to Africa to announce that their intention of building new military bases there was misinterpreted. Today, the U.S. President George W. Bush announced that his country is not planning at this time to build new military bases in Africa. The news of establishing a U.S. military command for Africa has echoed in the five West African nations on Bush's tour list. We know there are so many terrorists in, uh, in, this, uh, in the whole world. There are many terrorists in the world. Wherever the U.S. is present, there will be terrorism. Consequently, I'm afraid that something will happen today or in the future in Ghana, a country that is stable and peaceful. Until further notice, the U.S. military command for Africa, dubbed AFRICOM, will remain in its current headquarters in the German city of Stuttgart, which means that the U.S. will be monitoring Africa from Europe. The talk about AFRICOM, which started last October, overshadowed the issues discussed between Bush and the leaders of Tanzania, Rwanda, Benin, Ghana, and Liberia. The U.S. continues to extend aid to these African nations, while several countries, including Nigeria and South Africa and Libya, expressed reservations over hosting new U.S. military bases. One African nation, which has maintained historic relations with the U.S., offered to host AFRICOM. The country is Liberia, which is the last stop on Bush's tour to Africa. Meanwhile, Bush promised to seriously consider the Liberian offer. If the new command center is established, many believe the countries on the periphery of the Great Desert will be its main targets. The region is known for activities by Islamic groups, including those believed to be affiliated with Al-Qaeda, which the U.S. managed to make the main enemy for the vast majority of these countries. The Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas ruled out any step to unilaterally declare a Palestinian state. Abbas's statement came after Yasser Abid Rabbo, the General Secretary of the Executive Committee of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, called for taking such a step if the peace talks with Israel continue to be deadlocked. Kosovo is no better than us. If the negotiations did not succeed, then we will be forced to do what Kosovo did and declare an independent Palestinian state on the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. This does not violate international law, just as the United States and most of the European Union nations recognize Kosovo within 24 hours. There must be recognition of us and our independent Palestinian state. <laughs> Ambiguity surrounds the issue of Jerusalem and whether it was discussed during a meeting between the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. It appears that the Palestinians are convinced that negotiations with Israel will go nowhere if the U.S. administration does not activate the trilateral mechanism to implement the first article of the roadmap. 
The president will meet with the American Council General and he will officially request that this committee meets immediately. Because in reality, the continued settlements, annexations, and imposing facts on the ground taint any attempts to restore the peace process and credibility. Palestinians' lack of confidence in Israel's seriousness about the negotiations has strengthened the idea by some to unilaterally declare a Palestinian state if the option of negotiations ends up being a waste of time. We are not Kosovo. We do not have international forces. We are under Israeli occupation. Complete independence and sovereignty is dependent on close ties and achieving an Israeli withdrawal from occupied Arab territories. The situation does not have to do with what to do. However, our option is to work towards ending the Israeli occupation. Unilateral declaration of the establishment of a Palestinian state not only requires international support, but also the ability to control the entire region, which will include the Palestinian state. This is not an option because Israel, in reality, has been able in the past years to impose restricted areas or cantons on the Palestinian territories. I think the model canton is the Gaza Strip. This does not motivate us to repeat this experience in the West Bank. A mystery. This is how to describe the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. Heading to a mysterious destination. This is how to describe Israeli settlements, checkpoints, and the siege. This equation has compelled the Palestinians to re-examine their options. The continued deadlock in the negotiations between the Palestinians and Israelis does not offer Palestinians too many options. Perhaps the best option is to carry through with the negotiations until the end, or at least until the end of 2008. From the presidential headquarters in Ramallah, Khaled al-Qasim, al-Arabiya. With us from Ramallah is political analyst Hani al-Masri. Welcome, Mr. al-Masri. Is the new public change in tactics at the least aimed at sending a message to the Israelis and the Americans? The importance of Yasser Abed Rabbo's statements is that it reveals that continuing the option of negotiations without achieving any of its aims is not an end to all options. Palestinians must think about creating other options. It may be a declaration of a Palestinian state. However, a declaration like this cannot be symbolic or just on paper. They must be prepared to use their forces as well as Palestinian, Arab and international pressure factors. We must remember that UN Security Council Resolution 1515 refers to the establishment of a Palestinian state. Thus, the Palestinian call for a state does not come out of nothing. Yes, there are some major obstacles. First and foremost is the Israeli occupation and the internal Palestinian division, which has allowed for the establishment of an authority in Gaza different from the authority in the West Bank. Thus, this situation must be reconciled by ending this division and strengthening the Palestinian position by by pressuring Israel and making an option like this possible, especially amidst Israel stalling the negotiations and the lack of progress in the negotiations on the main issues or other procedural issues. Mr. Mastri, what do you mean by using internal Arab and international pressure factors to strengthen this position and this call? In general, does the regional or international landscape allow for such pressure factors to be used? We must work towards acquiring such pressures. How? We must not place ourselves under the mercy of one option. By using the successful popular resistance because we should not stand with our hands tied while Israel continues its settlement activities. According to Israeli sources, Israel has sped up the construction of settlements since Annapolis at a faster rate than in previous years. Also, the separation wall continues to be built. Jerusalem continues to be isolated and unified. The suffocation the siege of the Gaza Strip continues. West Bank roads are sprinkled with checkpoints and are cut off. All these measures mean that Israel is not wasting any time.
أهلا بكم كشفت مؤسسة الأقصى لأعمال المقدسات الإسلامية أن الاحتلال. The Al-Aqsa Institution for Renovating the Holy Places reported that the Zionist occupation has been digging a tunnel under the foundation of the Holy Al-Aqsa Mosque. The tunnel is being dug beneath the old city, passing through dozens of homes before reaching Al Wad Street, where a new synagogue is being built only 50 meters away from the Holy Al-Aqsa Mosque. Extremist Zionist groups are completely changing the true identity of occupied Jerusalem with the objective of creating new facts on the ground that will be difficult to change in the future. The digging is no longer exclusive to Al-Aqsa Mosque, rather it goes under the entire old city. The occupation forces changed the names of buildings that were built during the Umayyad dynasty and gave them Hebrew names to make it look as if they were built by Jews. The homes were given false names to give the impression that they were Jewish in the past. The wells in the holy city were not spared. The Jews have claimed that according to their forged books that the wells were there when the first and second temples were built. Their objective is to erase the Muslim identity from any Islamic site in the holy city. The Israeli institution has gone as far as claiming that some of the wells were there when the first and second temples were built. I read this myself, and these writings are still present. The Al-Aqsa Institution for Renovating Islamic Sites declared that the Zionist occupation is digging under the foundations of the Holy Al-Aqsa Mosque at a fast pace. The tunnel goes north under the old city passing through dozens of homes before reaching Al-Wad Street where a synagogue is being built. The Zionist occupation forces launched a brutal campaign to judify Jerusalem, taking advantage of the the fact that the Palestinians are preoccupied with their internal divisions. Fayyad's decision to allow the selling of Palestinian land to foreign nationals has created a great deal of concern that the land will be resold to Jews or foreign nationals who have animosity towards the Palestinian people. A new crime has been committed by Salam Fayyad and his illegitimate government against the Palestinian people. Fayyad has decided to allow foreigners to buy Palestinian land in the occupied West Bank under the pretext of encouraging foreign investment and economic development. This decision created an atmosphere of chaos and concern among the Palestinian people who fear that this decision will allow suspicious entities to buy Palestinian land and sell it to Zionists, allowing them to build more settlements on stolen Palestinian land to create new facts on the ground. This decision also allows the occupation to easily buy the land of Palestinian refugees who fled from the occupation crimes that were committed in 1948. The decision is an attack on Palestinian democracy because Fayyad has bypassed the Legislative Council and the will of the Palestinian people. The Palestinian land is being subjected to theft under ambiguous titles such as foreign investment and land development. Fayyad's decision also helps Zionist agencies which have been trying day and night to buy Palestinian land in occupied Jerusalem, the city that has been subjected to an unprecedented judification campaign. With this decision, Fayyad has made another attack on the Palestinian people. First, he cut off the only source of income of many Palestinian employees, then helped the occupation to put Gaza under siege, and today he wants to give away the rights of the Palestinians and sell their land, including the land that was occupied by the Zionist occupation forces in 1948. Among the things that may help Lebanon during its chronic crises is the fact that it has managed to maintain a leading position on the international and regional map of tourism. 
This may explain the strong reaction coming out of Beirut after Saudi Arabia issued a travel warning to its citizens in Lebanon. In addition, France took precautionary measures in that respect. Meanwhile, the Lebanese authorities are exerting a tremendous amount of efforts to put a lid on the recent security breach in the country. Ilian Chatri reports from Lebanon. During the past few days, Lebanon has been battered by a series of unusual cold fronts. Parallel to that, the security and political situation is moving in the opposite direction. This news comes after the Lebanese army was deployed in major areas and town squares in western Beirut in an attempt to prevent further violence. However, the latest waves of confrontations have brought back to memory the events preceding and following the Lebanese civil war. The Lebanese believe a consensus is much better than living the agony of a civil war. Once it reaches to this point, God help us. They are now afraid to come to Lebanon. They should restore calm in the country and reassure the people, and not otherwise. As soon as the events on the ground started to gradually improve, Lebanon witnessed another security development. This news comes after the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia warned its citizens not to visit Lebanon and urged its nationals in Beirut to take precautionary measures. In an attempt to downplay the warning, especially considering the strong relationship between his country and Lebanon, the Saudi ambassador to Beirut, Abdelaziz Khoja, said that the warning comes in the context of precautionary and preventative measures, nothing more. This decision has an external and not internal implication, and we know the Saudi position is somewhat different than the Syrians regarding some Arab issues, including the Lebanese issue. Meanwhile, France temporarily closed down its cultural offices in Sidon and Tripoli. Amidst these security developments, the Secretary General for the Arab League, Amr Musa, is due to arrive in Beirut at the end of the week to complete the groundwork for the Arab-sponsored initiative. It's a cold civil war. This is how some observers described the political and security situation in Lebanon. The country has been living amidst repeated and consecutive episodes of civil unrest, which has dissipated hope for a serious solution to the rather growing political crisis in the country. Elian Chatri, Dubai TV, Beirut. The Iraqi oil minister, Dr. Hussein Shahrastani, dismissed reports by some media outlets that Iran is illegally extracting oil from Majnoon oil field in southern Iraq. During a visit to Majnoon oil field, Shahrastani confirmed that an Iraqi foreign ministry delegation will visit Iran to discuss several important issues, including the redrawing of the borders between the two countries. During a visit to Majnoon oil field in southern Iraq, the Iraqi oil minister, Dr. Hussein Shaharistani, dismissed allegations that Iran is tampering with oil wells in the region and described these claims as unfounded and provocative. Shaharistani visited oil well number five, which is the farthest from Baghdad and the closest to Iran. It's only two kilometers away from the Iranian borders. There is no Iranian or Iraqi military presence in this region. Just like other oil fields in southern Iraq, Majnoon oil field is administered by the National Oil Company of southern Iraq. The allegation that Iran is maintaining control over the oil wells in Majnoon is unfounded and provocative. There are no Iranian civilian or military personnel around this oil well, which is the closest one to the Iranian borders. Shaharistani confirmed that oil is an important natural resource that shouldn't be ignored or forsaken, and it belongs to Iraq and the Iraqis. He also stated that an Iraqi foreign ministry delegation will soon visit Iran to discuss several important issues, including the redrawing of the Iraqi-Iranian borders. An Iraqi delegation led by Deputy Foreign Minister Mohammad Haj Mahmoud will soon visit Iran to discuss important issues, 
Both sides will help redraw the borders between Iran and Iraq, and they are expected to sign an agreement in this respect. There appears to be probable ambiguities in some border points, including the area of Imara near the Mithania oil fields. However, we have no problems whatsoever in the area of Majnoon. Every so often, certain political and media groups try to stir up controversy over issues that are unfounded and far from reality, perhaps to hamper the political process in the country and undermine its national interests. According to media sources, Shaharistani's visit to this border area between Iran and Iraq, which includes many oil fields, indicates that Baghdad is losing control and authority over the oil fields in that region. From the area of Majnun in Basra, Abbas Nam, Iraqiya. The European Union's Election Commission says Pakistan's parliamentary vote on Monday was generally free and fair. The election delivered a stinging defeat to the party of President Parvez Musharraf, who now faces a hostile opposition coalition parliament. Yes, the Pakistan People's Party and the Pakistan Muslim League of Nawaz Sharif will now sit down to try to work out a coalition agreement to govern. Sahel Rahman has the details now from Islamabad. What the EU monitor said earlier on Wednesday was that in, in general terms they were quite pleased with the conduct uh, of the polling stations. They thought that on the whole the election process had gone well. There were difficulties in some areas. We'd heard about those on election day and that they hoped that the election commission would be able to address them. There was also criticism though. They felt that the election commission had not made their own organisation as transparent as possible and that there were problems with local district uh, coordinators. Uh, they're sort of the type of mayor or administrator for towns and villages who they felt were aiding the former uh, political party, the former government, the PMLQ, uh, as, and that was an unfair advantage to opposition parties who were also trying to campaign in those areas. But generally, yes, um, they were quite happy and that the Election Commission have said that they will now formally announce uh, the winners and losers of the election by the end of the month. That's dependent on all of the candidates who have to now submit their election expenses uh, for approval by the uh, uh, election commission itself. For returning to our top story, of course, the elections in Pakistan. EU election observers have said uh, that those elections were generally free and fair. And to discuss that further, Michael Gala is the EU's chief election observer in Islamabad. He joins me now live. First of all, give us your assessment of these elections. Well, thank you. I have to collect to correct you slightly. We did not use the words free and fair. We said there were competitive elections, but there were significant challenges, both in the legal and uh, the security environment. And uh, we also said there was no level playing field for opposition parties uh, because the uh, outgoing government favored uh, the so far uh, ruling parties. But overall, we said it was, as I said, competitive and also the voting procedures were fairly well. Um, so that has been our assessment. And what about opposition concerns about rampant rigging by um, Sharaf supporters? Are they unfounded? Well, we found that the local Nazims especially, that they made use of their resources mostly to favor uh, PMLQ candidates. And that has been confirmed by, by our findings from our long-term observers on the ground. So uh, I think that is now perhaps with an incoming new government um, a chance perhaps to, to change. And that will um, also be in one of in our recommendations that we will uh, present uh, to make now use of the chance to change the election environment, to change the legal framework, to make, uh, to, to provide for the necessary um, um, structures that free and fair elections in a future stage can then actually be held. Coming up next, Link TV presents a new short film about Muslims in America, part of the One Nation Many Voices online film contest, highlighting stories, not stereotypes, about Muslims in America. And the winner of the $20,000 grand prize is...
I look to the right and all I gaze upon Reveals the source of flowers, rainbows and the dew at dawn Some see before and some see in and some see after I let my sight pierce the chains and see the master I want to live in a land called paradise I want to go to the valley of the king I want to live in a land called paradise See the birds fly and I want to hear the angels sing So many times in my life I ask myself the question What got me, brought me into all this mess I'm swimming in But pain is not and neither harm in the pool of bliss so slap me with your hand or kiss me with your softest kiss Tell me that you love me or that you don't like me now Tell me you invite me or that you don't want me around I won't cry over a world that can't change my life I'll put my money on what lies ahead in paradise I want to live in a land called paradise I want to go to the valley of the king I want to live in a land called paradise Want to see the birds fly and I want to hear the angels sing I try to do right and love my wife and trade and pray and talk I can be anywhere, do anything, and I'm mindful of God. I'm pleased and good and happy and harm, and now I realize that I already live in a land called paradise. I want to live in a land called paradise. I want to go to the valley of the king. I want to live in a land called paradise. want to see the birds fly, and I want to hear the angels. I want to live in a land called paradise I want to go to the valley of the king I want to live in a land called paradise want to see the birds fly and I want to hear the angels sing want to hear the angels sing Oh If you like this video, share it with a friend, post it on your website, or express your views. Just go to linktv.org slash one nation. And while you're there, be sure to check out the rest of the winners of the One Nation Many Voices Online Film Contest, highlighting stories, not stereotypes, about Muslims in America. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you.
This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.